Hey guys, NES Complex here. On this episode of Nintendo Power Time Machine, we're going to be talking about running, jumping, rescuing runaway frogs named Fred, and this crazy new idea from Japan, the RPG. It's all here in issue number three. Let's go! Flipping through an issue of Nintendo Power is like traveling through time. Nintendo's fascinating, nostalgic, and sometimes hilarious past is captured forever on its pages. Journey with me through time to discover Nintendo's history. When this issue hit newsstands in November and December of 1988, several strange, nostalgic things were happening in the world. Geraldo's broken nose was healing, and Mike Tyson, after a false report of his death in a car crash, beat his wife Robin Givens. Again. Meanwhile, in the film industry, it was exploding with classic titles. Child's Play, Ernest Saves Christmas, The Land Before Time, Scrooged, Naked Gun, Twins, Rain, 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 Rain Man, Rain Man came out that time too. But the truth is, all I cared about was Christmas and Nintendo. The cover of issue number three featured shoes. Not the most memorable cover. I guess after having the most frightening cover in Nintendo Power history, they needed to take a step back. Get it? Step? Step back? So I guess the shoes make sense for an issue featuring Track and Field 2, but what's even cooler is the logo on the shoes. I never noticed it was a C, N for Captain Nintendo. That kicks butt. Sorry. Track and Field 2 is normally the kind of game I would skip entirely, but I used to trade games with my buddy Jason back in middle school, and somehow, in one trade or another, I ended up with a copy of the game. And I was surprised, but believe it or not, I really liked the game. Of course, not all the games are equally well designed, but with 15 unique events such as fencing, triple jump, high dive, hammer throw, taekwondo, pole vault, canoeing, and archery, there's bound to be something in it for everyone. I really liked fencing and archery especially, but I hated the games that required rapid button presses. I'm looking at you, triple jump. Early on, every issue had a comic called Howard and Nestor. Basically, Nestor is this bratty know-it-all who refuses to listen to Howard, the voice of reason, and near omniscient gaming wisdom. Oftentimes, the comic would have a tip relating to a recent game. This one sorta helps with the insane red crystal Yuba Lake waiting at the wall part of Castlevania 2. <music> Issue 2 previewed the side-scrolling action classic Blaster Master, but on page 26 of issue number 3, it finally got the coverage it deserved. One thing that kind of cracks me up about this game, though, is its convoluted story. Listen to this. Jason loved his pet frog, Fred, more than anything. One day, while playing Leap Human, Fred suddenly hopped away. By the time Jason caught up, Fred had jumped into a box of leaking plutonium which had fallen from a truck. Although the box was marked dangerous, Fred, being a rather careless frog, had not read the warning. Instantly, the radiation made Fred grow larger than any frog in history. In shame, he jumped down a hole into the foul world of mutants, and courageously, Jason followed. At least there's no princess. I was always pretty bad at this game, and I never felt adequately prepared to help Jason rescue his beloved pet frog. But with full maps of several overworld areas and mutant bases, strategies on how to defeat bosses, and a nice explanation of the non-linear design of Blaster Master, Issue 3 certainly would have helped me. Yeah. And for the first time in Nintendo Power's short three-issue history, the poster makes sense and it's actually pretty cool. What I would have given to have a toy replica of Jason's rover. Maybe not. I remember seeing these sorts of Nintendo-themed supplies and gift ideas and longing to own them. But we could never afford it. The funny thing is, I still can't afford them since most of them now are rare collector's items. Game organizers, lunch boxes, bed sheets, action figures, 
towels, backpacks, non-functional impractical peripherals. And then there was this monstrosity. This issue also featured a section called Role Playing Games, and we really get to travel back in time here because this is so early in gaming history that Nintendo Power felt the need to explain what an RPG was. Listen to this. RPGs are not usually high on fast action. Instead, they have tremendous depth for experiencing long playing adventures. That's for sure. They require patience and perseverance. Pictures like this from Ultima really sold me on the idea of an RPG. It just looked so cool. What's strange is that at the time, this looked cool too. There was something, I guess there still is something, really compelling about high fantasy adventures. With dragons, knights, sprawling landscapes and spells. Even if the graphics are crude by today's standards, there's a magical quality in the innocence of those early RPGs. Every time I look at the counselor's corner section, I can't help but ask myself if I ever thought the counselors were cool. I mean, maybe Jack was cool. Garen was definitely cool. I mean, he's shouldering nine game packs. But did my 80s kid brain think Agent 317 was cool? Or Agent 015? Either way, we can always count on the counselors to help us with the most challenging aspects of NES gaming. Like, how to defeat Willy in Double Dragon or how to continue in Gauntlet. Well, I have a question though, counselors. Why doesn't Rambo have a gun? This edition of Classified Information featured one of the coolest glitches in the history of video games, the Minus World of Super Mario Brothers. It was an endless world of water that seemed to have no purpose. Kind of like Water World. Seriously though, glitches like these simply aren't possible in today's gaming world, but they made for some pretty cool playground talk back in the 80s. It also opened the floodgates for little lying bratty kids to come to school and spread their evil. They might come to school and tell you that Mario could turn into Link and triple in size and be invincible. But you know what? You'd believe it, because after all, there is a minus world. So why not? There have been hundreds of peripherals released across the gaming verse, but most of them are useless turds. There is one, however, that is almost universally lauded as the best of all time. The NES Advantage, or Advantage. Arcade stick, check. Slow-mo, check. Adjustable turbo, check. This thing had it all. There's another controller that has universal opinions, the NES Max. Of course, these opinions are universally mixed. This issue also featured Anticipation, which has some of the creepiest drawings in Nintendo's 24-year run. That's what I was thinking, too. Blades of Steel, which allowed you to break out into fist fights and play a simplified bit of Gradius between periods. And Cobra Command. This is weird. Weird. Anyway, anyway. This issue featured Cobra Command, the helicopter hostage rescue game. I wonder if they fixed Packwatch yet. Finally, televisions bursting in flames, screenshots, game titles, and explosions? Gone are the lifeless boxes and bland descriptions. Gone is the cereal box Qbert vomit. This section is 80% cooler than it was. This month, the Power Pad was announced, as were fun games like Spy vs. Spy and California Games. And the now infamous game Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was also revealed. One tragic drink and a classic horror film is transformed into a great video game by Bandai. Kindly Dr. Jekyll becomes the diabolic Mr. Hyde to his and your unending frustration. Was Howard Phillips trying to send us a hidden message? On page 82 we see the birth of a legend, Captain Nintendo. The concept was invented and written by Nintendo Power Editor Randy Stuttered, but was later modified and pitched to Deke as Captain N, the Game Master. Unfortunately, as I understand it, Randy Stuttered was never compensated for his idea. 
Now, I used to watch that show all the time, but even then, I was really annoyed by the way the characters were depicted. Mother Brain was a bossy loudmouth who looked like Lady Cassandra and talked with a man doing the voice. Simon Belmont was a vain chauvinist who always carried a mirror, and Mega Man was a toady little troll who talked like this. It was so bad that it actually diminished my appreciation for the characters in the games. The story in this issue isn't that bad, but some of the writing is a bit campy, like when the computer starts talking 80's street. Got it, replied the monitor. Okay, these really rad microchips, like, fused with our dude's central nervous system, and now he be jammin', he be jammin'. Wow. Now this was the November-December issue, which meant Christmas. And this issue featured probably the best contest that ever graced the pages of Nintendo Power. For simply filling out the player's poll card and mailing it in, 600 prizes, mostly games, were given out. Games like Blaster Master, Platoon, Freedom Force, Spy Hunter, Xenophobe, Rampage, Super Mario Bros. 2, Zelda 2, Contra, Metal Gear, Life Force, and hundreds more. Plus, one lucky gamer had the chance at winning a trip for four to Disneyland. This issue's celebrity profile featured... Jay Leno? Yep. It's hard to believe that someone with the stature of Jay Leno, the host of The Tonight Show, ever played games, but at that time, he was about my age, and he was known mostly for Doritos commercials. The question is, will he plug the power line too? Yes or no? Well, let's find out. Jay Leno takes his gameplay seriously. We first learned of his interest in the NES when he called, asking for help on level 7 of Zelda. Figures. In the mailbox section of this issue, someone asks a question that reveals for the first time someone we've all come to know and love. The question is, I was wondering who created Mario? And here's the response. Mario is a product of the active imagination of Dr. Miyamoto. Dr. Miyamoto? I wonder when he went from being Dr. Miyamoto to Mr. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay tuned for Nintendo Power Time Machine Episode 4 because the next issue is all about Zelda 2.